So feel good is a simple idea, but it doesn't mean just putting a happy face sticker on top of an empty tank of gas. And this whole new body of work with Ziba is about tapping into what I would consider the most creative and the most magnetic force on the planet, which is our sexual energy, and helping to utilize that to become whatever the F it takes to sustainably, reliably, and internally source your own bliss, your own fulfillment, so that you can change your vibration, so you can change your frequency. If you're asking the question, why am I so unlucky? Why didn't these dreams come true? Those are shitty questions. You're gonna get shitty answers. If you start to ask better questions, like I wonder what nature has in store for me, then nature will start to answer those questions as well. So it's like you have to go to like, what is the source of that hatred? What is it in my life that I'm hating so much when you have to feel it? Without feeling your feelings, then you're not going to be a vibrational match for that which you desire. Before we start recording, um, you were saying how you're in a, your, your life is sort of going through a phase of, there are a lot of things that are, are being modified you use the word destruction and, and we, you, you and I have a shared understanding of what that means in a sort of spiritual sense, right? There's always some destruction happening. There's always some maintenance happening. There's always some creation happening, mm. but, um, so that's, you know, obviously interesting and people can relate to destruction, but talk a little bit more about your personal practices, like writing your affirmations and past tense in the morning. What else do you do that kind of keeps you centered when you're, especially when you're navigating destruction? Yeah, I would say that right now feels like the biggest time of upheaval in my life since my divorce. You know, a move, a business change, a relationship change, my family is sick. And so it's, it's full out right now. And I feel more committed to my practices than I ever have. And it's like, it's almost like they can be a nice to have when everything is fine, but right now it's a need to have. You know, it's the thing that's angering me. So I'm happy to share. I would say sleep is a big one. I'm being pretty draconian about my sleep. So it's like I think about my morning routine in relationship to my night routine. Because if your night sucks, then your morning you're not going to do your morning, right? So I try to put my phone on red. I, if I was a little bit more advanced, I would turn my phone off, but I at least put it on the red light at night. And then I have red light in my room. So, and then I lay on my bio mat. I have a, I, I, forget, I think it's called a bio mat before bed. And then when I wake up in the morning, I'll tongue scrape, brush my teeth, wash my face. And then I do gua sha. I'm going to give you the full rundown. I'm going to give you the full like beauty and consciousness rundown. I do gua sha, but I do it while I hang out of my window. So I get sunshine in my eyes because I live on the 29th floor. So I can't really go. I mean, I could go outside, but I choose not to. Um, so I gua sha and then I meditate in front of my red light. And so I do a full um, Ziva practice, which for me is mindfulness, meditation and manifesting. And then after that, I go back to my biomat and I get out my journal. And sometimes if I'm in a, in a bit of a time crunch, I basically just write down my day in past tense. This is something I learned from my coach, Lauren Zander, and I call it daydreaming. And it's basically you just write down everything that you would love to happen in past tense. And I used to be in a, I guess you could call it a mastermind, but it was a group of eight women and we would partner up and every morning we would send our daydreams to our partner and we had to report back before we went to sleep at night. And you'd be like, yes, no, on the way. So you actually had to report back on the magic. Like what did you manifest and what did you not? Which is, it, it can seem like a silly game or it can seem competitive, which we, we did compete on it. But Really, what it is, is that you're training your recency bias and you're training your confirmation bias of your brain. And so if you have decided to believe that you're a powerful manifester, then your brain is going to look for evidence to prove that to be true. You know, I'm sure when you write your daily dose, you know, your daily dose of light, it's like your brain is constantly scanning your life for like, what's the lesson here? What's the learning? How am I evolving? And that changes the filter through which you live your life. And the same is true for me with the daydreaming. It's like I'm constantly looking for evidence of magic. Um, if I have an extended morning, which I did this morning, I will play my bowls. I'll pull a card. I have many different oracle decks. And, and I've recently started doing something called um, scribing, which is basically I'll ask a question to the universe, to a specific fractal of the universe, if you will. And then I'll just start writing. 
and see what comes through, which is different for me. Like usually when I journal, it's like gratitude or I'm manifesting, which is me. It's Emily talking to nature. But this feels like it's flipping the script and I'm allowing nature to flow through me. And it's more of a listening, receiving mode. And that's been really fun. I actually got a journal with different sections and I, I dedicate each section to different fractals of my guides, which according to the Vedas, you know, the language that you and I speak, it's all just you, right? It's all just extended you. There's only one thing and we're all it. But, you know, let's say I'm, I'm letting Lakshmi flow through me. Like Lakshmi is the piece of me that represents abundance. And so I'm tuning in to that frequency of abundance that's already inside of me and allowing that to flow through. And recently I'm looking for a home. So I've been tuning into Tara, who's like the Buddhist goddess of home and family. It's like letting her flow through me. And, and it's been a fun practice uh, to kind of get out of the way and, and see what nature wants to say instead of what Emily wants to say. I mean, I know that I am nature, but different parts of the brain. Yeah. And what's interesting is people may hear all of this and go, oh, well, you know, she's obviously got a bunch of extra time on her hands, but you're a single mom. You're, you're, yeah. you have a kid. You, who, how old is Jasper now? He just turned six. Right. So pretty mm -hmm. rambunctious, I imagine, because six-year-olds are just all over the place. And yeah, yet, and he's my son so with an extraordinary amount of energy. <laughs> yeah, but you're making time for these other practices. So can you just talk to the single moms out there or even yeah. the single dads out there about what you had to, I guess, reprioritize or do, do differently in order to carve out this space um, as a parent? to be able to do both because obviously you're, yeah. you're not neglecting um, your child and you're doing all. Uh, I mean, God willing, I, I, I know, I know I'm a great mom and I'm very attentive and he, we, yeah, he's great. Um, so you're right. It's a, it's a prioritization. And oftentimes I feel like I'm failing, you know, oftentimes I feel guilty that I'm not with him and I feel guilty for taking time for myself and, you know, occasionally I have him on the computer. I've been a lot better about that recently that I'm just really trying to minimize the screen time. But sometimes it's your only option. And it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have him on a screen for 40 minutes. I'm going to meditate for 20 and work out for 20. And then I'm going to be a better mom on the other side of that. So it's like worst case scenario, you just have a bit of screen time. But right now my mom is in town. So I have, he's out of school at the moment. So my mom came in for the month to help. And, you know, my mom's 81. So it's a, intense you sort of have a, my hands full and they love each other and so they're able to entertain each other and hang out um so what do I do I mean he's I've trained him you know just like you have to train your partner and your coworkers and your dog to be like this time is sacred right and so now he knows oh mommy's meditating and he'll try and get my attention a lot he'll be like mom 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 and, and I'll just wait and I'll tell him buddy you know if there's bones or blood please interrupt me if you're in danger please come get me but if it's not that, then you have one million toys. You have infinite amount of things to play with. <laughs> you are safe. And I actually think it's good for kids to be bored. Like they're, we've just constantly like giving them scrolling and treats and activities. And it's like they don't ever get a chance to tap into their creativity because they're never bored anymore. And so while it can be a little uncomfortable to move through that boredom portal, I'm excited about what's on the other side of his consciousness. And same for us with meditation. Like sometimes meditation is boring. You know, I think we talk about it in this way that's so like, it's the second coming and you're going to be floating on a cloud of bliss and it's so life changing, which it is. But you got to be willing to sit through a couple minutes of boredom in order to let your brain shift its state of consciousness. Um, so I'm trying to think of other things. I mean, when he's in school, it's easy, right? Like I just take him to school and then I do my practice after he goes to school. So he's there at eight. I usually start working at 10. And so I have like two hours in the morning where I work out, sauna, exercise, do all my witchy journal stuff. Um, so that's usually my thing. But in summer break, we're getting creative. And I love what you mentioned about, you know, well, with me, with a daily dose of inspiration, you train your brain to to confirm inspiration, you know, using the confirmation bias that we all have, you may as mm -hmm. well sort of uh, reprogram it to look for the things that you want to want it to look for. Yeah. And, um, and that's something that I've written about before, which is just a very simple thought experiment. If you, if you had a blog about red cars and you, you were going to go out every day and see how many red cars you could see, you would 
absolutely see more red cars than anybody else you knew, probably in the in the world, because you're just being intentional about looking for it. And the same thing okay. has, has happened to me with inspiration. I oftentimes mm-hmm. ask myself that question, like you said, like what's inspiring about this experience, even though it may not be a very, you know, um, happy experience or feel good experience, but there's some lesson in it in this. And that's because I just, I painted myself into a corner where I have to come up with something to say every day. <laughs> so you're literally scouring every experience you have looking for that inspiration. And I, I have do you to ever say, allow it to just be a purge? Like, is it ever just like, you know what? Like F it, like today was hard. Like, do you that, ever just that, let that, it rip? That's a post right there. Today, you just got to allow it to be a purge and not try to find inspiration. <laughs> <in it>. Brilliant, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes right. you just got to be in the is. shitter. You don't have to interpret everything. You know, that's inspiration right there. So it's just, yeah. it's a great way to kind of re, reprogram ourselves in real time. Because I think, I think that's an opportunity that we all have. And, and when I hear your morning routine, that's kind of what I see that you're actually doing is you're putting yeah. yourself in a better position to be a better human, right? However, you personally define that and not everybody has to have the same definition or same process as as any of us have but there's something that works well for you and it's about finding that yeah i love it because it i find that it's programming the reticular activating system or the, the ras which is the filtration device in the brain and so i i like programming that in the morning like i don't want to leave my house without setting my compass of what would i love to have happen And I think that the mastery comes into play when you develop this simultaneity of very specific placing of the order and full and total surrender and detachment from outcome, right? And I think that that's truly the level of mastery where it's like razor sharp specificity of your desires and complete and utter detachment from outcome because you know that that fulfillment of the desire is not going to make you happy. And yet it does not absolve you of the responsibility of placing the order. There's a Winston Churchill quote, which I love, which is that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And, and I really love that because it's like it's in, your life is never going to go according to plan. We know that your life is going according to plan zero percent of the time. And yet it does not absolve you of the responsibility of planning. Right. And so I think it's like that duality. It's that paradox that um, is where the richness is. And I think that's also the, de- the duality that I'm in at the moment because I'm, I'm really in a time of, of grief right now, like deep mourning, deep loss, lots of death and um, not, not physical death, but like lots of death of chapter. And so the thing that I've been playing with right now, and yet I feel very happy, you know, I feel very light. I feel very vibrant. Like I feel like I'm trusting myself and trusting nature more and more. And so the game and the dance that I'm in at the moment is how can I give myself permission to really feel my feelings, to not bypass, which is my former habit, but just like go in and cry and rage and be afraid and feel those feelings, but not allow them to be true and not allow the stories that my brain spins about those feelings to be true. And so the thing is that when we're in an uncomfortable situation, we don't like it, right? We don't want to feel those feelings. And so then the brain tries to solve the problem. Why is this feeling here? It's uncomfortable. Let's get out of it. What have I done wrong? What have they done wrong? Who's to blame? And so we start asking these really not helpful questions. And then the brain, because of this recency brains, because we are programming the reticular activating system really with every thought that we have, your brain will start to answer those questions. What did I do wrong? What did they do wrong? Why is this uncomfortable? How do I avoid this feeling in the future versus just feeling it and then putting your attention back on that which you desire to create? And so that feels like the dance that I'm in at the moment. And it's, I feel, I feel really proud of myself for the simultaneity of doing both. Yeah. And you're also very studied. You have had wonderful mentors um, throughout your spiritual life. Mm-hmm. And um, you've written a book, Stress Less, Accomplish More, which is an excellent gateway into the practice of meditation. But what I would like to, um, what I'm wondering about is obviously it's great. We're both big advocates for meditation, but in terms of, of understanding these other practices, you know, the affirmations and the power of positive thinking, and is there a book that has had 
the biggest impact on you in that regard? Like, let's, let's assume someone gets stressed less and they start meditating. They have the meditation part, right? Mm -hmm. How do you correct the intellect around and to make sense of all this other stuff that's happening so that you can start to um, implement more of the yeah, it's, it, natural optimism that we we want to all experience in the in the face of chaos? Yeah, so I would say it's for me, it's not. I guess in some degree it is optimism, but to me, it's. The manifesting practice for me as of late has been more about being brave enough to go in and feel the intensity and the darkness of what is. And then through that alchemical process, it makes space for me to even hear the desires and then to start to vibrate at the frequency of the desire. And for me personally, like I, I will to give some thought to some books because I'm certain I'm sure that I read some back in the day, like I started really studying manifesting probably like 20 ish years ago. But for me, I like to receive it orally. Like I like to just have like almost a constant feed of lectures or inspiration or people that I look up to kind of like saturating my cells all the time. Um, and I'll share some of the things that are turning me on in that regard as well. Actually, my, my coach just sent me a book. It's old school. Let me look it up. And I've been listening to it. Uh, it's a little, dare I say, boring but also works. It's called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. And I'll just listen to like, I can only really do 10 or 15 minutes a day. Um, but that one is, it's great. Um, I would also say, you know, Abraham Hicks, you know, Esther Hicks is the OG in this. So Esther Hicks is a woman who's also a channel for this entity called Abraham. And, you know, it's so funny because that was like, this Esther's been channeling for a long time, like 30 years or something back in the day that I mean, now I feel like everybody's a channel and a shaman. But 30 years ago, she was a trucker, like from Texas or something or West Virginia. And the fact that she was brave enough to be like, hey, everybody, I got this entity called Abraham that just wants to say some stuff. <laughs> just I like, really want to celebrate her audacity and bravery. And also her consistency, just still showing up, working the road, doing the conferences. And I got to go to my first Abraham Hicks, Hicks conference a few months ago, and it was amazing. Like, just so delightful. And it felt like meeting an old friend. You know, I've been reading her books and listening to her lectures for over 20 years. And certainly that's, like, become a part of me. Like, I've just ingested this material for so much that I don't even know, like, what are her thoughts and what are mine anymore? Because at the end, the, the truth is the truth is the truth. Um, but it was so funny to watch my body. Like every time Abraham came through, my body was like, Boom. like you could just feel the um, like energetic activation. Okay, what other books? I really love Regan Hillier. She's a friend of mine um, and she's a great teacher on manifestation. Um, and then the my way in as of late has really been through sacred sexuality. So, um, so what I'm working on in this whole new body of work with Ziva is about tapping into what I would consider the most creative and the most magnetic force on the planet, which is our sexual energy and helping to utilize that to become a magnet for your dreams. And, and that's been a wild ride because, you know, sexuality is so um, shamed and conditioned and there's so much cultural programming around it that to even dip your toe into it, it kicks up you know, all your stories, all your trauma, all your, all the, you know, everyone else's trauma and conditioning. And so even to play with it at all requires like, I won't say gloves, but certainly preparation because like you have to be willing to walk through the landmines in order to get to the goal. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. I love that. And I want to go back to something you said earlier about Esther Hicks. You said she was a truck driver and she- Well, don't quote me on that. I just know she knows a lot about trucking and driving and I, I, I am inferring <laughs> that. And I think that she and her ex-husband or her, her former husband, he's passed, Jerry, I think they used to be truck drivers, but we should fact check that.
Right. But my point was whether she was a truck driver or salesman at, you know, Macy's, she did something else. And then she eventually um, found her calling as the channel for Abraham. And you also had your own journey. And we've already covered this in great detail in our first episode together, which we'll put in the show notes. But you shifted away from entertainment to uh, spirituality and, and meditation. And now you're, you're, you're continuing to evolve. But uh, I want to I just talk a little bit about your, your in earlier process of making that shift. Again, as a woman, and then you became a mother and continuing to invest in that, right? Because you've said that, you know, you're looking at me, I'm, I'm pretty much a one-man show. I've got a, I've got a, a virtual team, a, you know, a couple of people who do things for me, but you have a, an entire, seems like you have an entire squad of people. You got director of operations and social media uh, people, and, and it's, but, but it doesn't, just knowing you, I've never met anyone else on your team, you know, but I've seen you do amazing things. You've got, you've got this incredible online course that's in development as we're having this conversation, but it's out now as people are probably listening to this in this moment. And uh, you've got another amazing online course. People can learn how to meditate. You do retreats, you've written books, you give talks, you do all the things and you have this incredible podcast that you just started. And I know there's somebody out there listening to this right now who is a truck driver, who's working at Macy's, who's doing something very conventional, yet she has, he, she or he has, you know, other experiences that they would like to start to explore and maybe make available for their community. And I'm just, I just want to talk a little bit about how you think about making the leap now in hindsight, you've been in the game for like 20 years now, you know, so what would some of your, some of your thoughts be in terms of best practices? Cause you know, we live in this age now where more people are becoming entrepreneurs and, and branding themselves personally and doing all the things. How, how do you, if, if your best friend wanted to do that, what would, what would be some of your, tips for going all in on on uh on creating community and creating a personal brand and making some of these teachings available to a broader community of people yeah i would say i mean well what you just said is like go all in and and I, I guess that that's a that's a very personal decision, right? Like, is this something that you really want to go all in on? Do you really want to dedicate the entirety of who you are to something? And I would I would really be honest about that question because oftentimes what people do is that they find something that they love and it changes their life and it becomes even a hobby, even dare I say like a spiritual hobby. And they're like, oh my gosh, I love going to meditation retreats. I love going to breath work and doing breath work. I love being in women's circles or men's circles. And they love it so much that they think like, oh, I need to do this. And so it's like just really being honest with the fact. It's like, do you love participating or do you truly feel a calling to lead this? Right. And, and if the answer is, is I truly feel a calling to lead this, then great, go for it. But I think it's, it's like the first determining, is this like something that I enjoy participating in? And if, if that's the case, then great. Um, then just do what you're doing. Do, take the tools and the enrichment and the consciousness expansion that you're getting from these tools and bring it back to your corporation, bring it back to your family, bring it back to your truck driving friends or your salespeople at Macy's. You know, like we're going to need lights in the darkness in all avenues. But if you're like, yes, I'm going all in. For me personally, I was still acting and teaching acting when I started teaching meditation. So I was sort of, uh, I'd say, um, but not bifurcated, it's, it's trifurcated a word. So I was acting personally, I was teaching acting, and then I was teaching meditation. And then eventually I stopped acting and I was just teaching acting and teaching meditation. And then finally, I think in 2015, I was like, I'm going all in. And I stopped teaching acting and I finally went full time at Ziva. I think this is, I was five years in from teaching. And it wasn't until five years in that I fully made Ziva my full time job. And when I did that, the energy that I put in started to return exponentially, right? Because my friend Todd Herman says this, 
if you have 100% energy and you split your energy and attention between two things, you are not giving those two things 50% and 50% because it's going to take you at least 20% to gear shift. So now you actually only have 80%. So it's 40 and 40. You do that again, it's taking you another 20% of energy to shift gears. So now I'm not great at math, but say it's like 20, 20, and 20, right? You're, you're allig- you only have 20% to give to these three things. You start to do that four times and you, and you can get the math. It, it, it does cost us something to context shift. And so, and I would say that I am multi-passionate. You know, I really love Marie Forleo because she is like, I think she speaks so well to women because we're not really like biologically wired to be hunters. You know, we're gatherers. So our consciousness is like, oh, I can, can hold many things in my awareness. I can be a mom and run the business and have a dance class and run retreats. I enjoy that simultaneity. And it does cost you something to context shift. And so now I'm in an area of my life where I'm just really trying to simplify, simplify, simplify. I'm reading a book right now called 10X is Easier Than 2X uh, by Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy. And I'm really loving it right now because, you know, I think we got a little overplayed on the idea of like, I'm going to scale and I want to 10X. And it's like, for what, for who, for why? But what I like about the idea of 10X is really the idea that it is in fact easier. Because the decisions that you, the clarity that you have to have to 10x your mission, whatever that is, I want to be 10 times healthier. I want to be 10 times better mother. I want to make 10 times more money. I want to teach 10 times more people to meditate, right? Like the decisions that you have to make and the clarity that comes from that matrix is different than like, I want to be 10% better this year. Because you can kind of just get away lying to yourself and doing a bit of the same if you just want to make incremental change. So at the moment, I'm in the process of really streamlining and be like, how could I do less, right? How, like, how could I do less but better? Um, but in the beginning, I would say that I had to kind of throw spaghetti against the wall. You know, I was teaching meditation and I, I was sorry, teaching acting and I loved that. I was teaching live and I loved that. I made the world's first, I, and you and I were very similar timing, but like we were like first in the game of like making the, one of the, some of the world's first online meditation trainings. And I realized that I love that. Like, I love learning about the technology. I actually love being an entrepreneur. Like you said, I have a squad. I have, a 10, I have 10 employees at Ziva. And I like running a company. Um, and, you know, it'd be interesting. I'd actually love for us to do a side-by-side of our calendars because <laughs> we're probably working the same amount, but you're just executing it yourself. And I'm like running a whole team and managing a team and they're executing, but it takes a lot of time and energy to get that transmission through. Um, but that'd be an interesting side by side. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but that was a lot of what I've observed from you is you, when I say go all in, right, you go all in, you, you, you don't, when you start, yeah, I'm going to go on a meditation. You take out a freaking commercial lease for God knows how many years. Most meditation teachers don't do that. Most meditation teachers rent a little space. That's what I was doing. $40 an hour. Oh, maybe can we get it to $30 an hour? You know? (laughs) You take out a whole lease, get a whole space, you know, shoot a whole course, do all these ads. Like you knew somehow how to run this business and you started hiring employees very early on. So, um, and, and, and even with your podcast, you know, it's like Emily doesn't just start a podcast. Emily has a million downloads in the first week of her podcast and 500 reviews. That shit is hard to do. When you're not going all in. So there's something that you do when you approach this stuff that just shoots you right to the, the top of, you know, the cream of the crop. And it's mm. very impressive. So what's your hey. secret? Oh, late. Thank you so much for that reflection. I really appreciate it. And I think you're right. Like once I do decide to go in and I'm like, I'm going to put my full energy behind something. Um, like I don't like to me, I don't understand the point of like doing something small or like mediocre. Like I'd rather honestly not do it than be mediocre. And maybe this is a trauma response. Maybe it's just me still trying to get daddy's love. Like who knows? But like if I'm going to do something like I want it to be amazing. And and I think with the podcast, it felt like, you know, I used to be on Broadway for 10 years. I've been singing and dancing and performing and entertaining since I was eight years old. And so the podcast was like, oh, cool. Now I can take my lifetime of performance training because podcasts at the end of the day, hopefully are entertaining, you know, like, yes, you want to learn, but you also want to be entertained. And I think that some of the best 
podcast, you know, we've got Dak Shepard from Armchair Expert. You've got Mark Manson from WTF, um, you know, now uh, Shameless. They're all comedians. And so it felt like, oh, here's this opportunity for me to entertain, to perform, but also to share not only my knowledge, but the knowledge of this amazing group of people that we've gotten to learn with and from over the past many decades of being in this space. And, um, and so it's really, I've really enjoyed it. And I also find conversation to be an art form. Like to me, it, it, it's like a painting, you know, and it's, it's one, that, but it's like an improvised painting. And so I've always enjoyed the art and the craft of conversation. And I would say I seek out help. Like I ask people, like, who helped you launch your podcast? Who, who helped you to do this? So I, I ask everybody, like, who were your secret weapons? And then I hire them. So I had someone who helped me with the podcast launch. We had a strategy, same with the book launch. So I was pregnant when I was writing the book and my, my son was born five months before the book came out, which I do not recommend. <laughs> But because of that, like I knew I was basically going to be on maternity leave during my book launch. So we had to plan it like 18 months in advance. And so because of that, we were able to reach out to so many affiliates. We were able to get me on so many podcasts. And so we had the luxury of time, which is not normally my forte. I usually, I have a deep existential kink around procrastination. Um, and I think it's really a form of arrogance when I'm like, oh, let's see how much I can accomplish in how little time. And so that it's it's like I like the adrenaline kick of it, but it's not really great if you're trying to do something big, you know, when you have a whole team of people and you require affiliates and, and you want to motivate the masses that requires some time. And so I think the fact that my son was born right before the book helped the launch quite a bit. But that's something I'm really proud of. Like with the book, we you know we launched at number seven out of all books on Amazon. We were a Wall Street Journal you know, bestseller. We would have been New York Times number five, but they didn't like according to book sales, but they didn't put us on. But um, yeah, I would say I don't know if it's like being an actress and just being uh, not necessarily competitive because I don't feel like I'm competing really with anyone but myself. But just by the nature of the game, you know, since I was 18 years old, I would show up and there'd be a thousand women in the room competing for one spot. You know, and so like I've been, I did that for 10 years and it's like, all right, well, you got to pull every lever you have. You have to be so conditioned, like your voice, your body, your emotions, your book, your outfit, like everything has to be the best you can possibly be if you want to be even considered. And so I think that that just became a part of me. And I used to joke that I was like the most competitive meditation teacher in the land. <laughs> I think that's softening a little bit now, um, but I think that I, I do enjoy excellence. And I also feel like I have much more support from like non-visible guides. Like I think that I'm, I think we all are very supported by the unseen realms, whatever you want to call that. But I find that now I'm finally have the humility to shut up and listen and to ask for help and to let these unseen guides help me. And I'm also a lot more disciplined about giving thanks. You know, I'm no longer under any illusions that I'm doing this by myself. And so I'm really like I spend a decent amount of my time like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like truly like high five. Good job. Thank you. And I think that, you know, I like to anthropomorphize nature because, you know, we all see things through the lens of which of that which we are. And so I feel like the more gratitude I give, the more support I get. And then it feels like I have a team. You know, it's not just me doing this alone. So, yes, of course, I have an amazing human team, but I also feel like I'm relying more on my my non-human team as well. You also mentioned coach. So I'm, uh, is that is that a part of your strategy is whenever you're doing something or maybe just in general, you always have a personal development coach or a business coach or a team of coaches? Mm -hmm. Like, What's your relationship mm -hmm. like with coaches? Yeah, so I'd say I'm pretty regular with therapy and coaching. So, I mean, I certainly will take breaks here and there, but I will almost always have at least one therapist and at least one coach, um, which I get is like a privileged AF thing to say. But to me, it's like I when you're the CEO, like, you know, like I mentor my employees or they have a manager that mentors them. And I think we all need that. Like we all are better in community. We're better when we're held to account. We're better when someone else is being like, hey, Let's set these goals together. And when you're the CEO, like who's doing that for you? 
And so to me, I, I think of my coach and my therapist, well, my therapist is different, but like my coach, I think of it as my advisory board a bit. And I've, I've never had a board. I've never had investors. You know, Ziva's always been like a profit. Like we've just always been profitable. So I invest those resources back into the company. And so the way I think about my coaches is that it's, that's my advisory board. And they're the ones that are inviting me to step up and then holding me to account and calling me out on my bullshit and helping me to see my blind spots. And, you know, just shout out to so Lauren Handel Zander has been a huge, um, a huge help to me. And then her right hand, uh, Lori Gerber has been my coach now for probably four or five years. And then I have some amazing therapists. Thomas Jones of the Paradox Process was my first therapist when I was 24. And he really first taught me about manifesting and um, introduced me to The Secret back when I was 24 and Esther Hicks probably as well. Um, and then as of late, I'm working with a guy named David Coates with IFS or Internal Family Systems. And that has really changed the game for me, like learning how to connect to little Emily. Uh, here she is. I don't know if you do video or not, but this is little five-year-old Emily. Come on. So she's been spending a lot of time with her these days. And um, Does she look like Jasper? Does Jasper look like her? Oh my her? gosh. Look at that. Because they're around the same age now. <laughs> do you think we, I don't know. Can you see? I do can't we look see like? it that well, but yeah, it looks, oh. like, it looks like there's some, definitely some similarities. Yeah. I think yeah. we look alike. Um so I've just been spending a lot of time, um, you know, healing my daddy stuff, healing my relationship with the masculine and, and doing that through like connecting with five-year-old Emily. And I think that this is such a simple practice. It's simple. Like gratitude is simple. You know, everyone thinks like, oh yeah, yeah. Gratitude. Everyone thinks they know like, oh yeah, yeah. Meditation, sitting quietly in a chair. Oh yeah, yeah. Gratitude. I get that. Oh yeah, yeah. Inner child. But it's like, these things are so simple that the profundity is exquisite. And I think that the most profound truths are the simplest. And so as I've been able to connect to little Emily more and more, as I've been able to hear her more and more and allow her to feel held and safe by adult Emily, it has been one of the most transformative tectonic um, healings that I've had in my life. Because it's like, if I know I can hold myself you know, like if little Emily trusts that adult Emily can hold her, then I don't get as triggered by other people. You know, like if my mom forgets to pick up Jasper, if my boyfriend says something silly or if my employees drop the ball, it's like it doesn't like little Emily doesn't feel like she's going to die. Right. That, that Like, oh, no, like other people are dropping the ball. I'm not safe because there's this relationship that is established between adult Emily and little Emily. and so. I think there's a lot of different ways to do this, to connect with that five-year-old version of you or eight-year-old or whatever. But in, if you're not willing to sit with those wounds, those traumas, if you want to use that word, but at the end of the day, like none of us had it perfect. And, and even, you know, obviously there's the capital T trauma, but even if you didn't have capital T trauma, you had a hundred percent of whatever your childhood trauma was. <laughs> And then your brain shapes around that. Like my, I had a therapist once who said that her husband, like the therapist had like non-treatable extreme PTSD and uh, non-treatable bipolar depression. She has since like healed, but um, and her husband, she's like had an amazing childhood, virtually no trauma. And she said the one thing that happened to him is he got his tonsils out when he was 12 and at the moment that he came out of anesthesia, his mother had been there with him the whole time. She went out to pee he woke up from anesthesia and she was gone. And so he was like, oh no, mommy abandoned me. Now this poor mom went to the bathroom one time for five minutes and now her kid has abandonment issues. Mm -hmm. So, it's, but the, her point was that like, even if you don't have capital T trauma in that moment, that 12 year old boy felt like he was alone. You know, he felt disoriented. He had just had surgery. And so it's like, whatever, you know, cards you got dealt, and, you know, if you're black or if you're Jewish or if you're coming from an ancestral line of deep, deep trauma, even if your childhood was great, well, guess what? You got your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents and all of that is in the cellular memory. And so we have an opportunity to, to heal that lineage as we take care of those little kids inside of us. Yeah, God, you said so much there. And I want to go back. <laughs> I want to shout. As I am what to do. Yeah, no, I want to flesh out um, this idea that it's privileged to have a coach. 
because mm. I feel like having a coach is obviously it's an investment. It's a startup cost in your business. And it makes such a big difference in you not having to reinvent the wheel. And so mm. a lot of people would see that as a nice to have, to use your language, but when it comes to being efficient and economical, it actually pays for itself pretty quickly. You know, if you have the right type of, of relationship with your coaches, and it's the same with meditation. Like we, we both know, we, we both have had the experience of working personally with thousands of people who just had no clue how to meditate, even though they had read all the books, even though they had listened to all the videos and courses and everything. But when they get into the room with you and they learn the simple, and, and this is, I love that would you, when you said, you know, the profound truths are the simplest. When you learn how to simplify things, that's why you work with a coach. It's not to complicate anything. It's actually to simplify a Amen. practice more than you would do on your own in your head, trying to piecemeal things together from all these books and YouTube videos you've, you've experienced. When you learn how to simplify things and you learn sequence, this is the most important thing for you right now, okay? Don't mm. worry about all these other 20 things. Once you master this, then you start learning this and you put those two things together and then you add this third thing and after you've mastered these first two. And that's how it starts to flow and people start having these epiphanies and the light turns on and you're like, yeah, this is, this is why people learn from in person, how to meditate with people like us. That's why people get coaches. That's why people join masterminds because you're in the room. And I remember yeah. I was hanging out with Lewis Howes recently, you know, Lewis obviously has a massive podcast. Yeah. My podcast is like a little net on the ass of a cow compared to Lewis's podcast being the cow. And we were talking about guests and I was asking him because he's very generous with me, you know, when it comes to sharing information, I was like, man, how did you get Kobe Bryant? How did you get this person, that person on your podcast? And he would go into these stories around how he just was relentless about tracking some of these people down. And I'm thinking to myself, as I'm listening to this, I'm not putting nearly as much effort into this as, I mean, it's clear why his podcast has this level of downloads and my podcast has this level, even though I feel like I'm making, you know, a good impact in the world and blah, blah, blah. But there's a work ethic that you learn from just being in proximity to people mm -hmm. who have done the things that you want to do that you would never, you'd never even consider if you're trying to figure this stuff out on your own. So I'm so glad you mentioned your experiences with, with coaches and with masterminds. And so then the question I have for you, you mentioned the secret, learning the secret when you were in your early twenties. I think any person who's, you know, had any contact in the spiritual community in the last 15 years has at least heard of the movie, the secret, which is from the, or I don't know which came first, the movie or the book, but the book. yeah. But now that you are teaching manifesting and obviously you've had all of these experiences and and perhaps exposure to different schools of thought. What do people get wrong about the concept of the secret, meaning the manifest? Because here's, here's what I've learned from, from writing books, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. You can't get too nuanced when you're writing a book. The publisher will water your ideas down so they're more palatable and more accessible for people who may read the book on a flight from Florida to, you know, Seattle. And without having to put the book down, without doing any kind of practices. So naturally things get watered down, but at the same mm -hmm. time, we just talked about the profound truths are the simplest. So what do we get wrong about the practice or maybe even the art of manifesting that we may have been exposed to from the secret and we have this very sort of um, casual relationship with this idea of manifesting? Yeah, what a great question. So I first just want to like give a huge you know, moment of gratitude to the secret and to everyone who is in it. And like, like I'm, I'm in a mastermind with a lot of those folks that are, um, you know, Jack Canfield and Lisa Nichols and, you know, Michael Bernard Beckwith. And, and so I'm really, very grateful to each of those teachers. And I you're in a mastermind with these people. 
Uh, well, in Minna Group, it's called um, Transformational Leadership Council, Amazing. and I'm I'm like the like I'm the, like the little youngin in there. It's like a lot of like, the, yeah. what's that little grasshopper? <laughs> yeah, I'm the little grasshopper, but I feel so grateful to like you know be surrounded by these legends, and like you said, to learn from them. And and so I want to really like, if it weren't for them and the work that they had done and the secret, like I think it would have taken a lot more time for these ideas to get into the zeitgeist and into. Just the idea that thoughts become things was revelation. You know, it was like a revelation in the 90s when that came out. And I think similar, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. I think people who are under 40 don't remember a time that meditation was weird. And so I just want to say, like, props to The Secret. Thank you for existing. I'm so glad that it does. And I think that it's, it's like a beautiful entryway because what they had to do was capitalize on the state of consciousness of where people were. So The Secret is sort of like, all right. Thoughts become things. And if you put your attention on this Ferrari or on this million dollars, you can manifest this million dollars or this Ferrari by putting your attention on it, right? Which is a little bit of like capitalizing on what we would call the I'll be happy when syndrome or the acquisitive approach to fulfillment, which, you know what I mean? I did the same thing in my book, stress less, accomplish more. I am taking the very powerful medicine that is meditation and I wrapped it in the candy coating of like, hey, this thing is going to help you make more money and have better sex. And, and if we were living in the same state of consciousness that we were when the book came out, I would do it again. But the planet is changing. Consciousness is changing very quickly. We're no longer in this hyper-masculine, hyper-acquisitive, hyper-accomplishment-focused world anymore. Like I do think, God willing, things are coming more into balance. I think that there is more feminine energy that is happening on the planet. And again, this is not about male and female. This is about masculine and feminine, right? So masculine is decisive. It is taking action. It is um, moving forward. And the feminine is discerning. It is magnetic. It is about being in alignment. It's about flow. And the masculine is, is structure and the feminine is flow. And we all have masculine and feminine elements. And if you really want to take this beyond gender, you could look at inside of um, a cell, you know, every single cell in our body has the masculine structure. It has the cell wall and it has the undulating flowing fluid inside that is the feminine. If you want to take even and go even deeper inside of that cell, there's the atom. And the atom has the, the Rubik's cube like matrix structure of the masculine form. But then there's the feminine light and energy that penetrates it or that like flows through it. But it needs that masculine container. So just really making the point that we all have masculine and feminine on the subatomic, on the cellular level, it truly is much beyond gender. So that said, I think that the whole world was much more in a masculine paradigm of like achieve, acquire, accomplish, get. And now I think that the pandemic and, and I think the intensity of the health of our planet and like the sort of precarious nature of how much longer humans have to live on the planet. Um, I think that that is forcing us to reprioritize, like, who are we accomplishing for? Who are we performing for and why? And I think that nature is uh, mandating a deeper level of symbiosis and harmony within ourselves and with the planet. And so as we're moving into this more feminine, or dare I say, it's not even more feminine, it's just more balanced, right? Like a more healthy balance between the masculine and feminine. I think that the name of the game with manifesting is very much changing. And I think it is coming into one of magnetism. It is becoming into one of discernment. And what I'm really passionate about is utilizing your pleasure to pray. Because here's the news. The better you feel, the more amazingness you attract. Like my, the simplest recipe I have for manifestation is this. Feel good place the order, place the order, feel good. Feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good. Feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good. And that might sound simple because it is. Like you just said, like you don't hire a coach to make things complicated. And I'm actually very proud of that distillation. It's taking me about 20 years to get my manifestation formula down into those two sentences. <laughs> and, and feeling good might sound simple because it is, but it's a full fucking time job. You know what I mean? Like I just told you my nighttime and daytime routine. It's hours a day. And I didn't even get to my supplements or my exercise routine or my therapy or my inner child work. You know, like so feel good is a simple idea, but it doesn't mean just putting a happy face sticker on top of an empty tank of gas. It means doing whatever the F it takes 
to sustainably, reliably, and internally source your own bliss, your own fulfillment, so that you can change your vibration, so you can change your frequency and become an energetic and vibrational match for that which you desire. So I guess to answer your original question, what did we get wrong about manifesting or what have we evolved into rather, is that the secret I think was very elementary and it was like, I'll be happy when. I can manifest this Ferrari, I can manifest this million dollars and then I will be happy. And I think what we're moving into and certainly what I'm very passionate about teaching is how do we internally source our fulfillment, source our bliss and even source our pleasure so that we have this level of detachment and we have this level of magnetism that actually the better we feel, the more magnetic we become and we're crystal clear about that which we desire, which I also think is very much related to our pleasure. Like if you don't know what you desire physically, it's very hard to know what you desire in your life. And as you get brave enough to know what you desire physically, you start to get brave enough to ask for what you desire in your, in your life. And so I'm, I'm very um, fascinated, if you can't tell, and passionate about this intersection of using our pleasure to pray. I love that. Okay, so I have a, I have a hypothetical for you that maybe you can shed some light on. Um, I used to, I, I, I remember, I think it was 2015, I did a New Year's Eve meditation retreat in Costa Rica. And a part of the um, ritual was we created, we wrote letters to our future selves for 2016 in past tense, you know, all the things, right? Write out, yeah. place your order, write out what you yeah. see for yourself, blah, blah, blah. And then I mailed everyone their letters. Um, just before the next new year, so they can kind of go back and open them up and see how things played out. And I mm -hmm. looked at my own letter and I had all these things on there and literally like 90% of it didn't happen. <laughs> right. But I had an incredible 2016. Like I wasn't upset. I wasn't, I just thought it was interesting that I had written all these things out and followed all the steps of, you know, conventional manifesting. And so my question is, when you, we talk about placing order, let's, let's just double click on that a little bit more and mm -hmm. break down. How, how do we, how do we kind of reconcile things may not happen in the way that we think? Yeah. What does that mean? Should we put it on the next? Give up. List, next time that we shift our attention to what is happening, right? Because the way I interpret it is, well, this is what needed to happen. This is what I wanted to happen, but this mm -hmm. thing that actually happened is what I needed to happen for my personal growth and evolution. Yeah, I love that. So I would say this, the short answer is that it comes back to plans are useless, but planning is indispensable, right? So it's like, you're okay, so your year didn't go according to plan shocking. <laughs> oh, wait, that's, that's never going I'm to not, happen. I'm not the only one. <laughs> and it didn't absolve you of the responsibility of planning, right? You took that time. You got quiet. What would I love? You wrote that letter. You started to plant seeds in your mind. But I would argue that your desires are divinely inspired. So all those things that you prayed for, all those things that you wrote down in that letter, that was you planting those seeds. That was you listening. How would nature like to use me to deliver my fulfillment to the world? And because of your lifetime of meditation, it's given you the lens of like, oh, it, this is what I needed to have happen. But I would argue that even beyond that, it's your desires are divinely inspired, not because the acquisition of the desire will bring you fulfillment. It's not about the acquiring of the thing. It's about whatever happens on the way to the thing. Who did you meet? How and where did you deliver your fulfillment? as you were taking action towards the dream. Like, for example, when I first started doing this work, when I first started doing the embodied manifesting work, the first download that I got, the first desire was a stadium. It was like, Emily, you need to lead 80,000 people, like full 80,000 people going into simultaneous climax, holding a shared dream for the species. That is the directive. It was very clear. And the audacity and the bigness of that dream had magnetism in it. And from that, I got on Aubrey Marcus's podcast. From that, I got a bunch of private clients. From that, I got invited to Egypt and to India to meet the Dalai Lama. Like all of these big things started happening because of the bigness of my dream. And then about a year later, I got a very clear message that was like, Emily, you have to let go of the container. It says it's not about the stadium. 
the stadium is actually too small. And also nobody wants to pleasure themselves in an aluminum, you know, stadium. <laughs> so it's, it's bigger than that. And so now the dream has evolved into activations at these sacred sites. So at the, the pyramids and in Cairo, the pyramids in Teotihuacan. So like going to like the, the chakra points of the planet, if you will, and doing these activations there. And the dream might evolve again. But I don't think that my happiness lies on the other side of 80,000 people being in Dallas Cowboy Stadium at the same time. And when that desire came in, I trust it so implicitly. I start taking action on it. And I'm, then I just let nature flow. Like God is not a short order cook. And I would argue that disappointment is the price of admission. It's not always going to happen according to plan. And I think that here's, an, here's an analogy that I really like. This is what I teach in one of my manifesting courses. It's, I always use my son. When he was like two, um, we were in the, in the park together and he saw the playground and he wanted to go into the playground and he ran, he beelined to the playground and he had his hands on it. It was like a metal gate. He's like, playground, run. And I was like, okay, buddy, let's go. And I took his hand and I was walking him around the perimeter of the playground to take him to the entrance because there was a, a gate around the playground. And from his POV, I was taking him away from the thing that he wanted. Now, I, and in this case, I'm going to anthropomorphize myself as God, right? Because I'm like the deity in this, for, for, for my two-year-old son, I'm goddess, right? So like, I have the power to pick his body up. And I could have lifted his body up, took him over the fence, and I could have plopped him into the playground. He might have broken a leg. He might have had a black eye. But I could have given him exactly what he wanted, exactly when he wanted it. And I think that that is true of our desires. Nature can give us anything that we want. But it's safer and more enjoyable and ultimately more pleasurable for everyone if I'm just patient enough or if Jasper's just patient enough to like walk around the perimeter of the playground, let's go to the entrance and then let's walk in and then you're actually going to get what you want. And you and also so show him how to access it on his own without needing some sort of miracle of someone picking him up yes. and putting him over the fence. Exactly. It's like, yeah, just walk yourself to the gate. Learn where the gate is. Learn how to open up the gate. Go into the playground. That You're absolutely how to right. Open up other gates to other things, other experiences. That yeah. That's well. a great, that's a great add on to that teaching. I love that. But, but it's like when we, when we mess ourselves up is when it's like, oh, I placed this order in 2015 on New Year's Eve. It didn't happen manifesting doesn't work. God doesn't love me. I'm not special. My prayers aren't answered. I'm not lucky. Right. And because again, I think Tony Robbins says the quality of our life is determined by the quality of our questions. And so if you're asking the question, why didn't this happen? Why am I so unlucky? Why didn't these dreams come true? Like though you're going to, those are shitty questions. You're going to get shitty answers. If you start to ask better questions, like I wonder what nature has in store for me. I wonder what nature is preparing me for. I wonder what divine timing is even more elegant than I knew to pray for, then nature will start to answer those questions as well. And so, and so this is what I was saying earlier with the dance that I'm in. Like I'm in a deep time of grief right now. And so it's uncomfortable. And it's easy to want to ask the questions of like, why is this happening? What did I do wrong? Why did, what did they do wrong? And instead it's like, what what is being like healed and, and annealed inside of me? Like, what are you preparing me for? What would you have me know? You know, and so I think that even in times of discomfort, even when we don't get the things that we want when we're manifesting, quality of the questions really matter. And I would add to that, that when you said, what are we getting wrong with manifesting? I think that a lot of people think that manifesting is just love and light and like just putting things on a vision board. And, and the whole modality that I've been birthing for the past four years, like the thing I've really like put my steam engine against that I'm, I'm launching in October, which I can't reveal the name of just yet. But like you said, there's going to be a course coming soon. It's, it's sort of three parts, the three part formula. And I can share the formula. And the formula is visualize, alchemize, magnetize. So we first have to visualize. We have to be brave enough to to ask for what we want. We have to be still enough to listen, to hear what we want. And then step two is alchemize. Alchemize anything standing in the way of you believing that you deserve that thing. You have to alchemize. And, and really what I'm doing there is just teaching people how to feel their feelings because we've been taught since infancy not to feel. And then if you have decades of repressed emotion, decades of unfelt feelings, that is naturally going to decrease your vibration, right? Like someone could put, a, like, 
you see the people who smile on top of acid eyes. You know, they have hate in their eyes, but they put a smile on top of it. It's not, you're not fooling anyone. So it's like, you have to go to like, what is the source of that hatred? What is it in my life that I'm hating so much? And we have to feel it. We have to release it. We have to name it. We have to move it. And, and if without that, without cleaning up your lies, without feeling your feelings, then you're not going to be a vibrational match for that which you desire. And I think that's where a lot of people run, like get their head up against the wall. And they're like, I'm praying for it. I'm putting it on my vision board. But they haven't cleaned up their daddy stuff. They haven't felt their sadness of their mommy's alcoholism. They didn't grieve the last breakup. And so that stuff is in their cells. So that's why we go through the whole alchemical process. It's like we're clearing the channel. And from there, from that clear channel, then we start to magnetize. Then we start to fill the body with pleasure. Then we start to turn on with, again, the most creative and magnetic force that nature has given us, which is our, what I call creation energy or sexual energy. I love it. Um, visualize, alchemize, magnetize. Is, is this a, 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 a framework that you developed for this particular um, course, which is obviously it's an online experience. Um, and I looked at the trailer from, I guess what you have up now, and it looks like it was a live experience that you've mm -hmm. sort of done before and honed it and converted it into this online experience so that it can reach more people. Now, both of us have done plenty of online experiences before. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to just hear a little bit more about the back end of this thing. How, how is it that you are creating it so that, because I think one of the biggest pain points of online experiences in general is people just don't finish them. And oh, yeah. we obviously want people to get to the other side of it, you know, because we know how valuable this stuff is. Mm. So what have, what have you done? What have you baked into the framework to help encourage completion? and just to help people get the most out of the experience. I'm truly so grateful for you asking this question because this is the thing I am most excited about in my life right now. <laughs> and I'll, I'll first share that Ziva, the average online course has a 3% completion rate, 3%, which is abysmal. Ziva Online has a 70% completion rate and we have a 70% open rate on our graduation sequence emails even after people graduate, which is something I feel very, very proud of. And I think that that is a, due to a lot of trial and error. And also, again, like utilizing my lifetime of performance training, like I try to make it as entertaining as possible and also give people the minimum viable product. Like what, like the videos are only 15 minutes long for Ziva Online. And it's just like, get to the chase, you know, take your 10 years of teaching and put it into 15 minutes, you know, best of the best. And so I think with this new course that's coming out, that so the Visualize, Alchemize, Magnetize, the Embodied Manifesting course that's coming out in October, I mean, I feel like we're going to change the game. Like, I think that what we just created, we just shot it a few weeks ago. And I think it's so much bigger than an online course because we ended up, we had 15 people fly in from all around the world on their own dime because they just wanted to be a part of the birthing of this thing because this work had impacted them so dramatically in the past. And we ended up basically running a retreat because like you said, I have run this in person. So I spent the past four years researching, developing, honing, fine tuning, because I teach, I, I have to create on bodies in public. Like I don't just sit down and write curriculum. I have to do it with people. And so I've been doing that for the past four years and I've really like sculpted it into this beautiful, very accessible um, formula, right? It's a formula and to help people live the life of their wildest imagination. So anyway, we had people come in, we shot it like a retreat. And we shot it like a documentary of a retreat. So even though we were doing 10, 12 hour shoot days, it was a film set essentially, even still the people said they were having ayahuasca level healings. They were like doing deep, deep work, even though there was a whole camera crew around them. I had an artist who volunteered to come, an amazing artist, Alex Ruiz, and he was painting and, and drawing while the ceremonies were happening. He said he made the most profound art of his entire career. I hired this amazing director of photography, um, named Everett Satoro, and he said he made the most amazing art of his life. And so it's, it is going to be both documentary and music video and online course. So I think it's, it's going to be beautiful to watch. I think that the actual transmission and the technique is extraordinarily powerful medicine. 
And you're following not just me teaching to camera, but you actually get to meet the people who are with me. And you get to learn from their different archetypes. Because there's some people there who are terrified of this work. Who, when the first, I had a woman named Jennifer come and she came on my very first retreat and she wouldn't even let us take a still photo of her. Like we took before and after photos of people and she wouldn't let us take a photograph of her because she didn't want to be associated with the work. She didn't want, and so she lied to her husband and told her husband that she was just going on a meditation retreat, even though this was very much like a sacred sexuality retreat. And it was a big issue. Like they almost got divorced. And then two years later, her and her husband came back together. And now she's in this video course with me. And she said, now I couldn't imagine not coming to be a part of this because this work has affected me so profoundly that I want everyone to know about it. And so you get to see like their different journeys and transformations. And so because sexuality is so triggering, there's so much shame, there's so much repression and trauma around it, that I think it's really important that you have a lot of safety built in. So I have two trauma-informed therapists who teach with me inside of the course. So we're giving people a lot of tools to resource themselves and it, by the way, this is not a tantric course. Like um, there's no self-pleasuring. It's very beginner, but it's also very um, potent and powerful. So what we've done to help people complete it is make it effing beautiful, also entertaining, and also the technique works. Like it just works. And it's sort of like three courses in one. It's going to teach you how to manifest. It's going to teach you how to not only feel your feelings, but also to embody them, to express them physically. And it's going to teach you how to magnetize. And through that magnet magnetism, it's like you also get a reclamation of your own body and a reclamation of your own pleasure, which sadly has been taken away from a lot of us. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. You, you mentioned the Tony Robbins quote, the quality of your questions um, determine the quality of your life. And so with this work you're describing, um, what are some more powerful questions that we can ask when it comes to just manifesting in general, or if you want to be more specific, manifesting the life of our dreams or following our heart or, you know, to make it less feminine and more masculine, just being of use. <laughs> what are some? What are some yeah. better questions that we can so, ask? I would say that when I do the visualize module, what I have people do, and this is even in Ziva Online, is that, you know, step one, we want to drop into deep coherence with ourselves. And if we're in a group, like deep coherence in the group, like that matters. To manifest from a place of stress or hyperactivity or non-coherence is kind of a waste of time. You, know, you really do need to be in a coherent state. Um, but then from that place, and I usually do it post-meditation, I will simply ask the question, what would I love? What would I love right now? And so when you go into love, it puts you into spirit. It puts you into possibility. What would I love right now? It puts you into the present moment. And it's not, what do I want? What do I need? It's not coming from a place of lack. It's not about the future. It's not about what I promised myself I would manifest when I was 12 years old. It's like, what would I love right now? So that's a really simple one. And, and I'd say that's my home base question. Um, and, and this is also a really good pattern interrupt when you're with your family at Thanksgiving or when you're out drinking with your friends and they're all complaining about how there's no men left in the town or there's no jobs anymore or the election sucks or you're just with a bunch of people who are complaining. A great system interrupt, a great pattern interrupt is like, hey, what would you love right now? And people are like, what? what? Because they just, we forgot to ask the question. We forgot to ask, what would I love? You know, even in a breakup, you know, like, how, what would I love? What would I love for this breakup to feel like? You're looking for a house. What would I love in this house? Instead of like, oh, God, there's so many listings and it's going so fast and the rate and the property taxes and the... <laughs> and it's like, okay, all that, those are just, that's just information. What would I love? And so that's, that's one question. Another question that's a little bit more advanced is, hey, nature. And, you know, this comes from our teacher. Hey, nature, how would you love to use me? How would you love to use me? And I love asking that question post-climax, right? When people are in this like post-orgasmic, deeply blissful state, their brain and bodies have been flooded with dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, norepinephrine. Like you've actually just 
tapped into the source. You want for nothing. You need for nothing. You are communing with God. You remember that you are God. And from that place, hey, nature, how would you love to use me? And then just listen. And when I say your prayers are divinely inspired, if you're listening for the inspiration from that place, you're going to get different answers than if you're just like running down the block late for your errands, late for your meeting. Like, what do I want? I like, need more money so I can have a private driver and get to this place on time. You know, and so it's like, what state of consciousness are we in when we are praying really matters. Yeah, I, I, I saw Dan Harris, who wrote 10% Happier, he posted something um, a couple of days ago saying how he was on a flight. It was a small plane. He started having a panic attack. That's one of his, you know, one of the, one part of his story is that he had this panic attack yeah. infamously while he was hosting uh, ABC Nightly News or something like that. And he had to be pulled mm -hmm. off the plane. And he said it was so embarrassing because people stop him in the airport and go, you're, you're my inspiration. You're my guru. I, I started meditating because of you. And yet he's having to deal with these very sort of human um, experiences of trauma that he's, he's been very open about working through. And I, and I think that, you know, you mentioned some of this in your, in your last share of how you can be navigating some very tricky situations. But I feel like as someone who's seen as a spiritual leader, you know, there's this kind of pressure that can be placed upon you to yeah. be elegant in the way that you move through these things. And sometimes you're just not. And so I was just curious, have you had any experiences where you kind of fell flat <laughs> when you were navigating these things that you would like to share? If not, that's okay. I just thought yeah, it'd be kind happy of cool to, to share. To share I think it's so kind of relatable to everyone else out here who's struggling. Yeah, I think it's so important to share because you're right. I think we put pressure on ourselves. And then because we're all looking, you know, we're all trying to think that everyone else has the answers. And so if someone's like going to put themselves in the position of being a meditation teacher, oh, they must have it figured out. And the reality, like we're all fucked up, like we're all traumatized. We're all human. We're all doing the best that we can with the tools that we have. And so the thing I actually feel most proud of in my spiritual journey is learning how to feel my feelings, like learning how to give myself the grace to be sad and to be angry and to be jealous and to be afraid and not try and bypass that. And, and I, I mean, my best friend, Layla Martin, is like a, she's like a world class Olympian at feeling her feelings. And I also live with Regina Thomashauer, who's a world class Olympian at feeling their feelings. And like these women bring so much light and so much joy and so much pleasure because they are willing to like just go to the bottom of the depths of their of their rage and their heartbreak. And so it's been really like I've learned so much from them, not so I mean I'm in all directions, but mostly about feeling their feelings. Um but I'll say that something that I've learned is that for me personally I need someone who is like bigger than me, stronger than me, has more capacity than me f in order for me to fully surrender into the feelings. And like that, ha that happens with Layla. Like Layla has the capacity to hold my darkness and not judge me for it. And when I'm in her presence, I can just fully let it rip. And it's like my, my darkness is celebrated. My sadness is celebrated. And then she'll just remind me that my love is even bigger than my pain. And so her having giving me that model has allowed me to hold that for myself. And now it's something that I very much uh, love giving to others. And I feel like it's what I, I do on my retreats, right? Because I'm in, I'm, it's big medicine that we serve up in this visualized, alchemized, magnetized. Like I'm inviting newbies who've never done breath work, never done sacred sexuality, never done medicine work, never done pleasure work to just go full tilt on all four. And so the amount of space that I have to hold is pretty extraordinary. And I feel like I'm able to do that now for these people because I know how to do it for myself. And so to anyone that's like, oh, I shouldn't be angry or I shouldn't be sad or I, I am now a meditator or I am now a coach, so I shouldn't be feeling these feelings, I would say, can you flip that and actually see those as your superpowers? That like the more you're, you have the capacity to be honest with yourself and to not get stuck there, but to like really become masterful at surfing. 
right? That they're like, life is not about just being on a high. That's boring after a while. Life is about like, for me, the simultaneity, like, can I see the sacred inside of the profane and the profane inside of the sacred? Can I find the light inside of the dark and the dark inside of the light and stop waiting for it to be either or because it never is. Yeah. I was looking at, um, visualize, alchemize, magnetize, vom, vom. Sounds like a mantra, vom. <laughs> I would, trust me, I, like I said, I, we had, did not have a name for this course until like three days before we shot it. And I was trying to figure out, I was like, maybe it's the VAM technique. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> the VAM, I love that. Maybe, maybe we'll play around and see, see what that is. Yeah. As a mantra. <laughs> well, you've got your book, Stress Less, Accomplish More. We've got this online course, this yet unnamed online course that will have a name by October yep. of 2024. We've got the podcast, Why Isn't Everyone Doing This, which is, which is seasonal, right? So you have seasons. You're in season two right now? Yeah, we're in season two right now, which you are a part of, which we're I loved our interview love so the much. Interview, yeah. You got a YouTube channel, very popular. Um, you have your Ziva Online course. Mm -hmm. We have uh, your Instagram is crazy, Emily Stella Fletcher and Ziva Meditation. And mm -hmm. so for someone listening to this, which is, is going to come out before your online course, what's a good sort of gateway into the Emily Fletcher ecosystem funnel? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I guess there's, the question is, do you want to learn to meditate or do you want to learn to the manifestation? Because I would say that both are great ways. And my guess is they're listening to your podcast. Hopefully they've already learned to meditate with you. And so <laughs> and hopefully they have that. Least. Okay, great. And so they at least have that foundation. And if they're like wanting to get in on the embodied manifesting practice, then I would say it's zivameditation.com slash magic. Um, and then we have a free masterclass that if they want to just understand the neuroscience behind the style of meditation that we both love so much, it would be zipameditation.com slash podcast. And that will take you to a free masterclass. It's just like, hey, how is this different? How is it the same? And also you get a style of, of my teaching, which I would say kind of straddles science and spirit. Um, and, you know, certainly I've been a bit more on the witchy spiritual side the past few years, but I did start on the more scientific side. <laughs> Now I think I have a homework assignment of bringing more of the science into the sexuality, because especially when you go into uncharted, it's not uncharted, it's just a very, a lot, of, a lot of landmines you're swimming in. So I think the science helps to calm people down. Anyways, even meditation.com slash magic for embodied manifesting and slash podcast. If they want to do a free masterclass to kind of give them a, a window into how Ziva is different. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thanks. Mm. Thank you again for for coming back onto the podcast. And uh, as always, you know, you're such a beautiful spirit and I, I get so uplifted when we connect and I wish we connected more in person, but hopefully, hopefully. I think these actually do go to Mexico City more because yeah. that means you've got it figured out. <laughs> you've got it figured out. <laughs> but I really appreciate you having me on. I'm so inspired by you. I'm so inspired by your creativity. The fact that you do what you do without a giant team is a miracle to me. <laughs> and thank you for your generosity and your preparation for today. I really feel honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.